Welcome everybody. My name is Gabe Scheinman. I'm the executive director of the Alexander Hamilton Society. Um, it's great as always uh, to have so many students, alumni and faculty joining us today. For those that may not be familiar with AHS, uh, we are a nonpartisan, not-for-profit national organization that seeks to identify, educate, and launch young men and women into the foreign policy and national security careers imbued with the Hamiltonian perspective, a strong and principled American leadership in global affairs. We operate first and foremost on college campuses across the country, where our student-led chapters host some of our nation's most eminent scholars and practitioners on U.S. foreign policy. Our over 50 chapters host nearly 200 plus uh, events a year on campuses, and we have over 1,000 alumni uh, in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere serving across the foreign policy and national security space. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, you can always go to our website and visit alexanderhamiltonsociety.org, and we'd love to connect with you. Today is a, is a treat, because um, not only do we have uh, a, a great author and a great expert on matters, but someone who's also been intimately involved with AHS uh, basically since day one, I think, um, yeah. and uh, not only uh, with some of our alumni and other national program, but actually on campuses, uh, which is really the foundation of what we do. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Peter Fever uh, to the show. Uh, Dr. Fever is a professor of political science and public policy at Duke University. He's the director of the Duke Program in American Grand Strategy uh, and the co-lead of the America in the World Consortium. Uh, he's published numerous books, including one that's uh, another one, actually, not just the one we're having today, but another one that's coming out soon. So he'll be back with us in a few short months to talk about that. Um, and he's a real expert on grand strategy, uh, civil military relations, uh, the role of public opinion on American foreign policy. Uh, he served on the National Security Council uh, staff twice in his career, and, and most recently under the George W. Bush administration uh, as senior advisor for strategic planning and institutional reform from 2005 to 2007. Um, and that is where I think uh, it takes us to uh, today's book, um, which uh, is really quite the tome, but it's called, oh, I apologize for the word screen, we each have it, uh, which is uh, titled Handoff, uh, the Foreign Policy George W. Bush Passed to Barack Obama. Um, Peter is one of the co-editors of the book, and, and that's important because the book itself uh, is a unique structure and I think really a unique lens um, into a process um, and into a period uh, of American history that um, that is not understood as well as it ought to have been. Um, and so, Peter, thank you for joining us, and, and uh, we look forward to the conversation. It's good to be here, and of course, I'm a big fan of AHS, as you know. So, uh, Peter, so this is, as I mentioned a little bit, this is an unusual book, but that's not obvious to most people until they actually pick up a copy, uh, which weighs 17 pounds, uh, and actually starts to start to read it. So maybe you can just start by telling us, what is the genesis of this book? How is it actually structured? What's the process of putting it together like? Because you're one of three co-editors, as well as the, the editor of the book is, is uh, Steve Hadley, who's a uh, former uh, national security advisor during uh, George W. Bush's second term. So maybe you can just kind of walk us through a bit first, this, the genesis and the structure of what this is. Right. Well, the heart of this book is a series of declassified memos that were written under Steve Hadley's auspices by the National Security Council staff in 2008 as they were preparing to hand over power to whoever was going to come next. They didn't know whether it'd be the Obama administration or the McCain administration, but they knew it wasn't going to be the Bush 3.0 administration. And though the, whoever was going to come in was going to uh, do abrupt changes in some areas. Both candidates were running against Bush in, in the uh, election to a certain extent. Uh, as it happened, the candidate who ran even more vociferously against Bush won. Uh, but the idea was the, we're going to be handing over a very complex world situation to the new team, and we need to brief them, or it would be helpful to brief them on what we have done in the full spectrum of uh, foreign policy and national security. So not just the high profile things like Iraq and Afghanistan, which were central to the campaigns and everyone was talking about, but lesser uh, prominent issues like Af uh, Iraq, sorry, like Sub-Saharan Africa, like Southeast Asia, like uh, development policy, et cetera. And so this was a soup to nuts com uh, compendium of memos, transition memos. And each of those memos was, were combined into a, a binder that was given to President Obama's team, along with an appendices that had memorandums of conversation between the president and the relevant heads of state in, if, if it was a regional memo or um, executive orders and, and statements, things that would be harder to, for the outside team to know about, or in some cases they couldn't know about them until they be, 
became uh, the new team, but this would be a one-stop place for them uh, to have it. The appendices are not in the book. Those are on a website that is, um, or the ones that have been declassified anyway, are on a website run out of uh, Southern Methodist University, uh, but the memos themselves uh, are declassified well ahead of schedule and put in the book. That's the heart of the book, but there's more to the book than that. Let me just pause there. So, so um, the, the, the way you describe that process, this sounds like common sense. Uh, this sounds like uh, things that you would hope that uh, most people do. This sounds like a normal thing that happens in any business, uh, which is that there's a, there's a, when people leave, there's some sort of exit interview and there's some sort of documentation left in place and there's an onboarding with a new team. But, um, you know, I, I know this just from, 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 from being in DC, but also from, from talk to you over the years that this was actually unusual. So maybe you could give us a window into uh, what did national security transitions or transitions between the White House national security teams look like in the past? Um, if that was a motivation for doing this effort in the first place, um, and then how how was the effort actually structured uh, in the moment? I mean, it's 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 difficult to uh, stay in your current position and write somewhat of a status uh, update or even a little bit of a retrospective when you're still in the moment. Exactly, and so I think people nowadays know a little bit more about the Presidential Records Act than they might have all, uh, historically done because of well, the some, some some people some people clearly still don't. So I, I don't know if that's quite true. Fair but enough. Yes. But the, the trouble that President, uh, former President Trump and to a lesser extent, Vice President Pence and um, President Biden are in over presidential records. Did they take home documents? Uh, that derives from the Presidential Records Act, which says that at the end of a presidential term, all of the presidential records, so that would be all of the documents that are at the White House that were generated at the White House under the term of a president, the outgoing president, they back up um, large uh, tractor trailers and they take all of those boxes of documents are supposed to get them all <laughs> and ship them to the presidential library. That means that at 1201, when the new team has comes back from the inauguration ceremonies, they arrive in their office and the safes are empty. There's nothing there because the previous uh, be, because those those papers were presidential records of the old administration. So uh, it's been likened to a lobotomy that the government, a self-administered lobotomy that the country would go through every four to eight years during a transition. Obviously, this, this, seem, this seems insane. I mean, they couldn't just, well, you know, make a copy and, and keep one copy there and send the originals to the archives. I mean, it's, it doesn't seem that deeply, complicated. It's deeply problematic, and indeed, they've now changed the laws to get to allow for more um, uh, better practices. In part, some of the practices that the Bush administration pioneered in two thousand eight. But um, the uh, the the argument is that these are presidential records related to the previous administration. But your point is, yeah, but the new team has to continue uh, the running the world uh, immediately. And so the running American foreign policy, at least immediately. And so there's no time for them to quickly get up to speed. So uh, over the years, they've developed workarounds that will honor the Presidential Records Act, but also help prepare the team. And one of those is uh, preparing briefing memos for the incoming team. Those are at the heart of this book. Uh, and the Bush administration took that more seriously and more um, uh, comprehensively than previous administrations had done. Now, in full candor, I have to say this is probably the less welcome part of this transition process because the incoming team is our, has been elected on the premise that you all are idiots, you, the outgoing team, are idiots, and we're here to clean up the mess that you've created, so we don't need to hear from you. Uh, as to how to do our business. So the memos themselves sometimes are received with more or maybe less uh, enthusiasm. But alongside that, there's an, a, a parallel effort to brief up the team on really urgent crisis type situations. And in 2008, it's worth reminding, 2008 to 2009, it's worth reminding the audience, we had two genuine national security crises unfolding. Uh, 
One was the two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. Actually, the Iraq war was in a better place by 2009 than it had been, say, at the start of the presidential campaign. Arguably, Afghanistan was in a worse place by the transition uh, than it had been at the start of the campaign. But then there's a separate crisis, the, the financial crisis, which of course had great implications for the US role in the world as well. So both of those were ongoing and were gonna be uh, managed first by Bush, but then handed off by, to the Obama team. And they couldn't, there could not be a missed step there. And we couldn't afford to have say a terrorist strike on you know, at noon on inauguration day uh, because who would handle the response, et cetera, et cetera. So, there was a lot of contingency planning, a lot of sharing of information uh, with the teams, particularly with the once President Obama was President-elect Obama, a lot of sharing of information so that on day one, they knew what were the capacities of the United States, what were the commitments that the US had made, and what they could and could not do if a crisis happened. And on that part of the transition, President Obama and his team actually were quite public in praising the Bush administration for, uh, you know, for the lengths that they, they went to. Now, you know, fast forward several, a dozen years or so, it's now um, standard practice uh, to do this in future administrations. When it came Obama's turn, he tried to do this for uh, the incoming Trump administration, and the the Trump side of the transition process was 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 chaotic. So it didn't it didn't mesh as smoothly as it had in two thousand eight two thousand nine. Somewhat to the surprise of the audience, they might be surprised to know that O'Brien, who was the uh, President Trump's national security security advisor, uh, once President Trump had lost the election. While the other stuff was going on in the Oval Office, O'Brien was trying to run a, a fairly traditional handoff of responsibilities to the incoming Biden team. And Jake Sullivan publicly praised uh, O'Brien for some of that transition efforts. Oh, and in all of those cases, the best parts of it were things that had been you know, uh, pioneered and developed quite uh, uh, deliberately in 2008 by the Bush team. And this, this uh, book captures one aspect of it. So that's the first uh, part of the book. Let me now mention the other part of the book, which I think is what makes it uh, especially unique. So first it's unique that you could get access to these documents way ahead of the normal declassification schedule. The second part is Steve Hadley went back to the teams that wrote the original memo and said, Go back and regrade your homework now. Now it's been, you know, a lot of water under the bridge since 2009. How does the your memo look in hindsight? But also, what's happened since, and how would you evaluate what President uh, Obama's team did and President Trump's team did on this same issue, whether it's North Korea or Iraq or the war on terror, what have you? And so you get the same kind of uh, you get a snapshot of how they how this team saw it in 2008, and you get another snapshot of how they see it more or less today, uh, and it's remarkably candid. You know, there's obviously it they're grading their own homework, so they tend to grade it a little more favorably than outside critics do, uh, but they're not. It, it's not propaganda, and I think this will be a real resource for students of foreign policy, particularly those who are trying to understand this crucial time period, because they have now access to documents they wouldn't otherwise have. They can compare these documents to say the Bob Woodward books, which were written uh, or more or less at, in real time, but didn't have full access to all of these documents. And then they have access to the really serious reflections of the team in hindsight. I, I think it's a great resource, but as so, you know, oh. It's very long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, but the advantage of it being a resource, despite it being long, is that uh, uh, students can can dive in on the, the sections that are relevant to them or, or, or of interest to them. Um, before I go full bore on some of that substance, one, one more question about process and, and transition process itself. So um, in addition to the fact, obviously, that uh, an incoming administration uh, spent you know 15 months campaigning to throw the bums out 
uh, beforehand and are not necessarily going to see things eye to eye, they also can set things up or structure, let's say, uh, the White House and the National Security Council differently. Um, and I'm curious, from the organization of this effort in the first place, um, uh, how the outgoing, let's say, Bush administration, if you could describe a little bit, how the outgoing Bush administration, NSC, was structured and how ultimately the incoming Obama administration was structured, because it's it, the book is set up not the structure of the book um, is not set up in the way the NSC directorates are actually set up um, because it is set up. But you, I mean, you know, you have, but it is set up in sort of like crises, essentially, and sort of longer term stabilization right. effort and then great power competition. Um, and then actually some there's a couple in there that were not memos written at the time, but um, right. a couple memos that were written currently as if if we were to have written them at the time, what would we right. have done? Um, yeah. But so pandemic it's not, is a good example of that. <laughs> yes. Pandemic, right? Um, so it's not exactly there, but but I'm curious more in just in, in a sense of a, a handoff. Um, uh, it, it, you know, usually paints a picture of people running in the same lane, right? It's it's sort of the relay race, right? Running the same lane, and that's not always true um, when these ad administrations and coming out can kind of match up. So maybe you could describe for us just what the structure was uh, coming out and and what the structure was coming in. So maybe I would describe it as uh, jazz improvisations on a common theme. So every administration organizes the NSC more or less at, on, along the following core elements. There is a um, regional bureaus that divide up the world and sometimes there'll be a slight change. Do we put Pakistan here or do we put Pakistan there? Uh, but they're broadly organized regionally, and those directorates help the president for any policy that he or she will engage in that touches that part of the world. Is he going to speak to the leader of that world? Well, the, this office will prepare them. Here's how you pronounce their name. Remember the last time you talked to them, you asked about their kid in college or whatever. You know, It'll sort of prep the president in a pure staffing way for meetings and for policy decisions that have to come down. That's one chunk of directorates are regional directorates. And each one is headed by a senior director with, depending on the size of the region, a number of directors underneath them. Underneath the directors, nothing, nobody to direct. Director is the lowest rank on the NSC staff. Um, so, uh, then there's functional areas like defense policy, arms control, uh, intelligence. Um, and over the last 50 years, the, the functional bureaus have grown. So the regional bureaus have changed a little bit, but the functional bureaus have changed a lot as new issues become available. So when I was in the Clinton NSC, it used to be defense policy and arms control that also covered non-proliferation. Non-proliferation became more and more important in the uh, 90s, and so it got its own directorate, which was separate from defense policy and arms control. Um, and uh, sometimes the issue becomes so important that it, it develops not just a directorate, but a super directorate to the size of co-equal or almost to the size of an NSC. So Clinton administration added the National Economic Council reflecting the idea that economic issues in the 90s were a vital part of national security. They've always been, but now they needed more attention. After 9-11, Bush added Homeland Security Council. And uh, so there was a, a NSC and Nas National Security Council, a National Economic Council, and a Homeland Security Council. These were uh, all you know, reflecting the greater importance of terrorism, et cetera. Then the rest of the NSC is made up either of, you know, staff, pure, pure staff things to help to make the paper work run or HR support or something. And then the core uh, communications people that run the Situation Room, the 24-hour watch uh, center in the basement of the White House that keeps the president, you know, and the White House linked up to every place in the world at all times. Can you talk a bit about, no, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say a little... Fun fact, you, before the Katrina hurricane, the Situation Room didn't get local regional TV. Why would the White House need to know what's going on in, say, New Orleans local television? Well, they figured out after Katrina, we probably do need to know that. So they changed the, the comms. So those, of course, have changed with technology 
in uh, the, the Situation Room has. But anyway, that's the NSC as a structure. And each one of those offices, the incoming team will say, okay, we need to staff these up. And the, at the top of each of these places, uh, these offices are political appointees who will disappear when the new team comes in. And then there'll be some number of detailees from the State Department, from Defense Department, from NSC, I'm sorry, from the intelligence community and elsewhere, who in theory can stay and help the new team. Uh, and usually that's what happens for the first month or several months, the detailees remain behind and help the new team uh, you know, make that transition. But eventually the new team of politicals who come in on right away uh, that will hire new detailees. Uh, and so over time, the office will change in personnel, uh, at, even though the structure will be, you know, more or less the same with some improvisations and rifts and differences. Sorry, that was you, a lot. Yeah. You, you mentioned how the um, incoming Obama team was quite um, even publicly appreciative of the, of the, of the seriousness uh, of this effort. Um, on the contingency the planning, yes, yes. On the contingency. They were a little dismissive planning. on the the memos, but yes. So I was that that was where I was that was where I was going, which is um, and not not to um, dissuade uh, uh, students in the audience, or I'm, I'm speaking with a professor who spends his life researching and writing. Um, but um, are there examples that you could point to in this in this transition process where you know the incoming Obama administration had a certain at least public view during the campaign, and then based on actually. Uh, talking to people who've been in that seat for you know a number of years from reading uh, you know one of these memos, let alone the binder that you took up, that say you know maybe this is a little harder than we thought, um, and maybe these guys have a point, and you can actually point to saying you know that actually led to either a bit more continuity or or, or a shift from the um, uh, putative policy that they 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 assumed coming in. So I can't point to an example where the Obama team publicly acknowledged this fact. I can point to examples where they uh, did it without acknowledging it. And the most obvious is Iraq. So President Obama campaigned, then Senator Obama campaigned on uh, a plan to get every, reduce Iraq or get out of Iraq entirely in, in something like 16 months. It was, it was a crazy timeline. Um, and when they asked, you know, where'd you come up with that timeline? Did you do any analysis? Well, no, we just assumed you could remove a brigade a month and. And so that's what we that's what we did. It was uh, not a well thought out plan. Um, it was also premised on the idea that Iraq was totally lost, could not be salvaged, and we should just cut our losses and get out. Um, and whether or not that was a fair reading of the situation in 2006, when Senator Obama first announced this plan, and then of course had to campaign on it for the next year and a half, it just simply was not the case when. President Obama took over in January of 2009. By that point, the surge, the President Bush's surge, um, uh, and I'll insert a little advertisement for a different book that Steve Hadley and I worked on called The Last Card, which describes the, the uh, inner workings and based on oral histories of the surge decision in 2006, 2007. Great resource for students as well. But anyway, that surge had produced results. And the Obama team came in and realized that's that's the case. Iraq is not in the bad, terrible shape that we thought it was in. It's not a lost cause. In fact, it's probably on a path to strategic stability of some sort. Never, it will never be the success that would justify the original invasion, but it's probably worth consolidating these. And so uh, he they abandoned their get out of Iraq immediately policy. They adopted instead the Bush transition for Iraq plan. They committed themselves to negotiating the follow-on strategic framework agreement, that which was part of the Bush plan, uh, which would allow the U.S. forces to remain even after they handed everything over to the, the Iraqis. They put their best person in charge of negotiating that agreement, which was uh, Vice President Biden. He was confident he was going to deal deliver success. He said, I bet you my vice presidency, I will secure this, this deal to allow the US to remain. Uh, and so they, from 2009 to 2011, were uh, more or less following the Bush plan. And then when they did not get 
the uh, ne the deal that they wanted uh, from the Iraqis, at least not in the format they wanted, uh, they decided, okay, we're going to change course and we're just going to leave Iraq entirely. And um, and so they, at that point, they broke with the Bush plan and went in their own direction. And as you, in the memo that we cover, the sort of retrospective memo uh, in the book explains why that didn't go so well. And by 2014, President Obama and his team, he's ordering people back in combat troops back into Iraq in 2014, more or less under the agreement, framework of the agreement that the Bush people had wanted him to secure uh, and was available to him in 2011. So that's kind of the an Iraq case where they said, this is, uh, it turns out the Bush team had a better plan than, than maybe we thought not justifying the original invasion, but justifying the, the policy as it was uh, handed off to them in 2009. What do you think, um, you, you mentioned two, two things and I'll combine them into a, a, a question here, which is, so the first obviously is that as by, by dint of this project, uh, these things are declassified, these memos have been declassified way in advance of what they normally would do. I mean, basically half the time um, uh, than they would normally do. And that is an advantage, number one. And second, you, you mentioned how in 2008, uh, both uh, presidential candidates were running against uh, Bush foreign policy. Both both uh, Senator Obama and Senator McCain, not and not to not to you know preview the next uh, fifteen years. But um, you know I don't think that really stopped. <laughs> uh, that, that was really just a, a, a digital short uh, for the future that came afterwards um, in terms of candidates for both parties running against that. So combining these things, I mean, now that you're looking at this project in its totality, um, and I think there were forty memos initially, and thirty of them are in the book. Um, what are the what are the moments of the areas that you you feel as somebody who just lived through it, but also has now overseen this project, you feel are really misunderstood? And I, I don't mean misunderstood. I you know agree or disagree with the policy, but just actually right. misunderstood and, and might be the uh, most interesting areas areas for um, you know scholars to actually dig into more and shed a better light uh, on this period. Well, I I think the the typical college course that is available to the typical undergraduate in America. Probably if they cover the Bush period at all, and, and they may not, you know, uh, but if they do, they probably cover it in a cartoon caricatured version. And they'll make it as if it was entirely all about lying about weapons of mass destruction to so that we could invade Iraq and topple it, it and impose a democracy at gunpoint. Um, and it was all filled with unilateralist, uh, you know, go it aloneism. And uh, that's basically, if they talk about Bush, that's, that'll be it. Uh, and whether or not that's even a fair criticism, I don't think it's a fair criticism of the decision to go in Iraq. It was much more complex than that caricatured portrayal. But more to the point, as the book presents in pretty numbing <laughs> detail, there was a vast array of other topics that the, that the administration was dealing with, some where they were making progress, some where they were not making progress. But, but it was just not the case that the Bush administration was asleep at the wheel and ignoring the rest of the world. Now, it is true that Iraq and Afghanistan, the war on terror more broadly, consumed a great deal of uh, presidential um, mind share of the leadership attention and national resources, and of course the human costs as well. So I'm, I'm not diminishing that. Uh, and you could have an interesting debate of, well, could we have made more progress on this area or that area if we had um, had more you know, spare capacity, spare bandwidth to allocate to it? Those are fair questions. But what you can't say is there was no policy elsewhere. There was nothing was being done. The, there's a, a a fairly coherent Asia strategy that is being attempted. In it was one that was tailored to the China that we had, that we were facing in 2001 to 2008. It was more dovish than some of the internal Bush critics wanted. So there was a debate inside the Bush administration: do we be more hawkish? less hawkish with, with respect to China. The Bush, the, at the top decision was made, well, we're gonna engage China uh, and we're gonna hedge. Uh, but they hedged with 
strategic outreach to our allies, particularly our democratic allies in Asia. So uh, deeper relations with Japan, deeper relations with South Korea, uh, deeper relations with Australia, and a strategic initiative uh, building on the initiative that Clinton had started, but taking it much further uh, with respect to India. And that was all part of a hedging strategy in case our primary line of engagement with China would uh, come a cropper. Well, we now know it did come a cropper, uh, but both Obama and, and Trump and now especially Biden are following back onto that network of relationships that were deepened uh, during the Bush administration for precisely this purpose, you know, for such a time as this, if we encounter a different China, we will need to have close relations with the other countries in Asia. And so that's set in motion in the Bush administration. Uh, another example would be we're at the 20th anniversary of PEPFAR. So we're, we just had the 10th, 20th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq. Important to reflect on that and, and the the all that that entails but we also have the 20th anniversary of the of the president's emergency plan for aids relief uh which was particularly focused on sub-saharan africa it's it's, it's global but especially uh was transformative in its impact in sub-saharan africa and this was a clear case of presidential leadership there wasn't you know a strong grassroots push that said we have to do more uh, development aid in africa <laughs> This was um, President Bush with a number of his key aides who saw an a need and an opportunity, a need with uh, many states that were going to be completely uh, broken for a generation by the AIDS, uh, by the ravages of AIDS, which was going to decimate the population um, and an opportunity that there were medical pro, um, treatments available, but just too expensive. And so they were available for the first world, but not available where the need was greatest. And so uh, President Bush pushed through a very ambitious, uh, historically, you know, uh, you know, something on the scale of, um, you know, one of the great, uh, two or three great uh, uh, humanitarian efforts by the United States. And and it was transformative. It uh, it it was interesting when um, President Bush visited Africa at the end of his uh, administration to sort of review how the policy has gone. Uh, there was he was received as a hero. You know he, he was reviled in the United States by this point, but he was uh, treated as a hero for all he had accomplished. And. Um, and one of the leaders said, oh, I just hope that the new president, in this case, they, by this point, they knew it was going to be President Obama, that the new President Obama will be as good a friend to Africa as President Bush was. You know, So the point is, there's, uh, it's just a fact that there was a lot more uh, nuance and breadth and depth to the Bush uh, a policy than, and, the, and the, the book captures that. Two more examples. People uh, pretend that the global war on terror was all about the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan and nothing else. Well, that's, AO, if you want to add a, a something else would be enhanced interrogations and Gitmo or something. But, but as the, the documents make clear, there was a, a, a real large effort to uh, change policies across the board, integrating law enforcement, diplomacy, and intelligence in ways that had not been done before, if they had been done effectively in the 90s, we might have had the warning that we needed and would have been able maybe to, to stop the 9-11 attacks, perhaps. In any case, those efforts uh, go to a, go a great deal to, that were put in place over the eight years of the Bush administration go to, were more or less adopted by the Obama administration, more or less adopted by the Trump administration, and help contribute to the fact that we haven't had a mass casualty attack on the United States from a transnational terrorist group of global reach, as was everyone thought was going to happen after 9-11, that the, it was inevitable that it would, they would strike again. This apparatus helped prevent that from happening, and that has been handed down. And so the war on terror was far more institutionalized, far broader, far more sophisticated and less, you know, military specific uh, than is 
commonly portrayed. And one last example is that the US did a much better job of working with partners, both close allies, but also you know, adversaries where we could have made common cause on a, a single issue where there was room for improvement. Uh, and so it was not nearly as unilateralist as the caricatures that you sometimes hear on college campuses would say. And so I think the book does a good job of dispelling those myths. It's still possible as one of the chapters does. So we hired or asked two respected historians, uh, Mel Leffler from UVA, Hal Brands from Johns Hopkins Sice to write, you know, step back reviews of the whole thing. How do you assess it? Mel Leffler's a chapter which is in the book is pretty critical uh, and makes you know some sharp critiques of the Bush administration. Uh, but I think he also acknowledges that that the the myth mythological critiques that are popular uh, in the, the media are, are just not borne out by the evidence and that, and that the book helps dispel those caricatures. So you you highlighted just there obviously a few examples that that you think the criticism and most importantly, the criticism at the time, right? Because that's in some ways yeah. the, the, the biggest point was um, cartoonish, right? To, to use your words. Let me flip it also for you, which is, um, I don't know when exactly you had access to the memos or, or if you had remembered all of them in the first place and so forth, but what are the things that you read and you sort of looked at this now and, and with, that, with that perspective and you looked at this and you said, oh, I can't believe we got that so wrong in the moment. Um, or I can't believe they did, and that the criticism, let's say, that, not even necessarily the criticism, it could be that people might not even been aware of it or, or it felt um, uh, more minor than some of the main things you're talking about. But what are things that you, you looking back on on uh, that work um, and using this project as that lens and saying, you know, we just, we, we could have, with the information we knew at the time and the debate that we might have had on the inside, we could have done this differently. Well, I will. I won't say that um, we could have done it differently, but the North Korea chapter is a painful read uh, it, because we basically have a two, two, three decade um, bipartisan record of failure in confronting the North Korean nuclear program, uh, and it's a painful read. Not because uh, the the team was was not good. The team was excellent. Uh, we had an approach, uh, it didn't work. Uh, Obama tried a different approach, that didn't work. Trump tried a third approach, that didn't work. Uh, and so the step back memo on North Korea says, maybe this was doomed to failure. You know, Maybe there was no way that we could, uh, short of you know, going to out, out and out full scale war, which uh, no one wanted, maybe there was no way to um, prevent North Korea from developing the nuclear arsenal it had. And that, that's what the step back memo, the, the later postscript says. And the original memo is you know, more hopeful that golly, you know, if we just keep the pressure up, uh, maybe, uh, and if you know, Obama does not drop the ball, maybe we can um, uh, up, succeed. I would argue that the Iran uh, uh, approach is similarly, you know, in in hindsight, uh, we're you know, of course, today it's it's Mar what April twenty twenty three. Iran is so close to a nuclear capacity, uh, has already reached what we would have called the failure of our policy mode. So if you go back and read what we were trying to prevent uh, on, in terms of Iran, we wanted to prevent Iran getting this close, that it would be not failure if they've crossed the, the nuclear threshold, failure if they got this close to being able to cross the nuclear threshold. Well, we're here and this is a failure. Why, why, was it a, why is it a failure? Well, um, probably because the Iraq war went poorly. If the Iraq war had gone well, as it looked like it was doing in 2003, there might have been an opportunity to uh, reach a, an agreement with Iran, it's similar to the agreement that was reached with uh, Gaddafi, uh, where Gaddafi gave up his WMD uh, ambitions because he thought he was gonna be next. Uh, 
And Iran suspended their work on weaponizing uh, a possible nuclear uh, program uh, in 2003 because they were afraid they might be next. Uh, and if the Iraq war had uh, lived up to its expectations from the team that had, you know, from the first administration, the first term of the Bush administration, what they thought they'd be able to accomplish on Iraq, if that had come to pass, say by 2005, then we could have been in a different position maybe in terms of Iran policy and that, uh, but as we all know, the Iraq war did not go as expected. And by 2006, the US was facing the possibility of actually losing in Iraq and Iran was on the ascendancy in Iraq. And, and so by 2008, Iran has uh, benefited, you know, geopolitically from the, the situation in, in Iraq and is, is much, much harder to deal with in, on the nuclear file by 2008. So that's another uh, missed opportunity. And the last one I'll flag is, uh, is China. And that's a, that's, that's a hard one um, <clears throat> because the China today is China of Xi Jinping. That's not who we had. We had China of Hu Jintao. Uh, and I think China experts can debate, and you've probably had them on podcasts before. Uh, good friends of AHS will debate, well, that's the same China and we were naive. Uh, we, meaning the Bush administration, was naive on, on China, uh, possibly, but there was, uh, but the context was, was very different. And the, the what if that I'd like to point to is, golly, if we had not had the financial crisis uh, of 2008 and had instead been able to make a little bit more progress on um, uh, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, this is the idea, the trade agreement that, that was hatched under the Bush administration and handed off, but in a very you know, embryonic form to the Obama people, uh, but if we had made more progress on that and had been able to better knit together that vision uh, in Asia, a vision that would set standards that would force China to stop its you know, currency manipulation, to stop its unfair trade practices, if it wanted to keep up with where the future of the world economy was going to go, if we, that had been able to be put in place, um, would that have... Uh, adjusted the calculation for Xi Jinping in, in ways uh, different from what he actually faced in 2012, which was no TPP, uh, a United States that talked about a pivot to Asia, but was not really doing tangible pivoting to Asia. And, uh, and so we got the worst uh, of Xi Jinping rather than uh, the best of what might have been hoped for. So that's, that's another, uh, you know, what if hindsight that you, we can um, reflect on. And there are also some, I mean, you, you were talking about uh, on both the, the good and the bad or whatever, the good and the missed opportunities, some larger lessons, but there's also some smaller lessons that, uh, again, uh, things that might have been criticized at the time or, or forgotten at the time that have relevance today. So for example, the, the thing I always think about is uh, Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld when, when uh, France and, and Germany um, objected uh, to joining or, or getting involved in, in the coalition to go into Iraq, the Secretary of Rumsfeld had this famous quip of, well, that's old Europe, and new Europe is with us. And he was referring to the fact that the vast majority of the um, uh, former uh, Eastern Bloc and, and, and including former uh, Soviet republics um, were actually contributing to Iraq. And, and what is going on today? Well, in Ukraine, it is actually, be, in addition to the British, we should mention, um, it is those very countries that are actually leading the effort right. um, in Europe in those ways. Or you mentioned uh, uh, um, uh, India uh, and the important role that played uh, during the Bush years as well, uh, the second term. Um, we also forget that Australia, South Korea, Japan, each in their own ways actually did contribute uh, uh, troops to uh, both Afghanistan and Iraq in different ways. And so the debate that we're having today about should, uh, you know, this, this zero sum, I think it's a bit of a fallacy, but the zero sum, well, we, we have to either do Asia or do Europe or European allies should focus on Europe and Asian allies should focus on Asia. Um, and yet, even 20 years ago, um, obviously, we had Asian allies that were focused on the Middle East um, in different ways. So I think there's also some interesting um, lessons or, or previews, even diving deep into these things and that don't come across by accident. Those are those are coalitions that get built as well.
Yeah, that's a that's a fair point. I also one other point. I know you're going to want to get to uh, Q and A from audience, uh, but I think if you read the book, you'll see that there's actually a lot more continuity in American foreign policy than you would expect if if you only paid attention to American foreign policy during presidential campaigns. <laughs> so the only time you listen to uh, foreign policy matters is when the presidential campaigns are shouting against each other. Uh, then you would assume that the United States is flip-flopping wildly uh, every four to eight years. Uh, that's not the case. There are important changes. Uh, elections matter significantly. But in the nitty-gritty day-to-day of running American foreign policy, uh, there's remarkable continuity. Uh, and you know this is a topic for a whole other podcast. But what of Trump's policies has Biden continued? It's that list is longer than you would think. Uh, and so that's just a, a, a hardy perennial of American foreign policy. And I think this book helps lay that out by going into such uh, granular detail on policies in parts of the world that don't get, you know, front page attention. Actually, that would excuse me to my last question, and, and then we can go to Q&A. And, and for those interested in asking questions, you can submit your question in writing. I'm in the Q&A um, box um, at the bottom, and, the, and then I'll unmute you and you can ask it. Um, were the memos written in this book, were the memos written in the voice of, and, and, and again, I, I knew some of the, I know personally some of the people who wrote them, and so I, could, I can tell sometimes, and sometimes I just don't. Were they written in, in the voice of giving their most ardent assessment in their way of the policy, or were they written in an attempt to persuade uh, the incoming administration of the, the the rightness or, or or the assessment of let's say in the policy because you can imagine you might talk about something that you had done in a certain way because it makes sense to you in your worldview and then realize that that argument might not work in the same vein uh, to whoever is uh, taking your seat but if you you know cast it in a different light then there are elements of that to your point uh, about the right. continuity that's there right that iraq might be a good example of that you know the people who who served in the bush administration might talk about iraq in a certain way the freedom agenda is kind of built throughout this book um and so forth um yet the pitch to the obama administration might have been it doesn't matter if you disagreed with this at the get-go it doesn't matter if you didn't like the rhetoric it doesn't matter if you don't even like the policy but cutting and running now will still be worse um right. than, than, than putting that way so i'm just curious in terms of what was the charge given um, at the outset in terms of the, the the voice, let's say, that was used in these memos? So, well, it's interesting because it allows me to tell a, a sort of behind the scenes story. When the, uh, the initial charge for this was uh, passed down from President Bush through uh, Chief of Staff, White House Chief of Staff, Josh Bolton, th through Steve Hadley to the team, it was not greeted with, you know, wild enthusiasm because the NSC job is already hard enough. There is already, <laughs> a, you know, the day-to-day -day job was hard enough. And this, uh, you know, I'm told uh, from friends that this had the feel of, oh, great, another, you know, goat rope exercise. Um, and so the initial response from the team was, uh, unenthusiastic. But <laughs> then word came down that says, actually, President Bush is going to read personally each one of these things. Uh, and uh, this will become an important part of, you know, the ultimate future, you know, uh, historical record uh, 50 years from now. So that's when the teams, uh, you know, cinched up their belts and, and uh, wrote really careful, candid uh, essays. And I think, um, by and large, the, the caliber of the original essay captures well the caliber of the, the staff member on the NSC team. You know, they, we had very, very good people. Didn't mean they didn't make mistakes. Of course, they made mistakes, but, but they were very serious, um, thoughtful people. And they were not, this is not campaign propaganda. This, this was not expected to be declassified for many, many years. So this was a serious attempt, each one of these memos is a serious attempt to explain why the policy took the course that it took. Um, and yes, where when the policy was, you know, subject to really high profile public criticism, there was a little bit of extra effort to explain, look, we get it, we understand why you might say this, but understand these other points that are, you know, maybe 
less obvious, but help explain. So there was, it was written with that effort of, can we create empathy on the part of the Obama team? But it also wasn't written with a naive sense of, man, we're gonna persuade the Obama team to change their entire platform uh, because uh, we knew, uh, the Bush team knew that President Obama's team had lots and lots of bones to pick with the, the Bush team. And so it, it was realistic is what I would say in, in that regard. Um, but it wasn't, so it wasn't written from a public rhetorical persuasion point of view. It's more of like a, to use the old TV show Dragnet, just the facts, man, this is the logic. This is what we actually were trying to do. And if you don't like it, okay, you're responsible for it now, but understand this is why we did what we did. Great. Uh, all right, let's go to, we have time for a couple questions. Uh, Rudy Novak, the mic is yours. If you could introduce yourself and ask your question. Hi, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Figure, for being here. Uh, yeah, uh, Rudy Novak, I'm a student at Johns Hopkins SICE. Um, so my question is, um, so much has been made about how domestic politics, Schweller and others can influence foreign policy. Um, but pure realists uh, believe that domestic politics can't and won't interfere with the state policy agenda. So my question is, was there a domestic political element that influenced Bush's transition efforts and Obama's foreign policy? As you mentioned, that foreign policy uh, is remarkably uh, similar throughout the different administrations, no matter what the party is. But were there actual events that changed? That's Aha. Well, this allows me to put my uh, professor hat on and cite one of the most obscure pieces in my um, uh, on my CV. Uh, I think you've mischaracterized realism. Uh, academic realism doesn't say that domestic politics would, won't affect foreign policy. Uh, I academic realists uh, say that when domestic politics affects foreign policy, it's going to go bad for the administration. So they are conceding that uh, foreign policy is shaped by domestic politics from time to time. But they say, when that happens, it's bad. It's the neorealists who say, we can assume that away and assume that anyone whose foreign policies over time have been overly infected by domestic politics will be punished by the marketplace. That's Ken Waltz's marketplace analogy. And they'll be selected out of the, the system. And so uh, sort of a survival of the fittest Darwinian kind of way, if they're so stupid as to let domestic politics matter, then it will, um, uh, uh, then th they'll pay the punishment for it. So that that's my minor professor professorial pedantic uh, uh, response. But more to your more general question, let me address it. So domestic politics, particularly via the uh, economic crisis, really mattered in the 2008 transition in the sense that uh, there was a fear a realistic fear that if this financial crisis is mismanaged, the United States could plunge into uh, something as, as bad as the Great Depression. Uh, and therefore, uh, and, and everything else we're trying to do globally, every other uh, threat that we face globally will be magnified uh, tenfold if we're in that situation. So we have to get that right. Um, and that was an area where there was actually very good cooperation between uh, the Bush team and eventually the, the Obama team, uh, where they just on the at the Treasury level, you know, the incoming Treasury team and the outgoing Treasury team worked very, very closely to make sure that there was no disruption that would spook the markets further uh, and that some tough medicine that the Obama team thought was necessary wasn't delayed for months, but we administered it to the economy, to, to the patient, uh, as soon as, as it was determined that that medicine was needed. And so um, that's not, your, not exactly what you mean by domestic politics, but that is one really important aspect of um, domestic politics that did shape the transition. Now, the more general way, a form of your question is, does partisan, political considerations shape foreign policy. So the president's desire to be reelected in 2004, does that shape 
the foreign policy in 2004, as President Bush, uh, running in re-election 2004. And if so, does the absence of that, you know, the fact that he didn't have, he wasn't running in 2008 and his vice president wasn't running in 2008. So he's the, it's a true lame duck administration in that regard. Did that, did that shape it? And I would say less than the outside world thinks. The outside world, I, in my experience, overstates the degree to which partisan politics uh, is skewing foreign policy, national security, uh, at least in the Bush administration that I, I could watch very closely. I watched that very, very closely because I was one of the few people who had, um, you know, toes and visibility into both of those worlds by virtue of the position I held out on the NSC staff. And what I saw up close was very different from what I would read from critics outside as to, uh, to how it works. I'm not, obviously I'm not saying that domestic politics never plays a role. I think I would argue that President Obama's concern about avoiding a, a left flank uh, primary challenge shaped his approach to Afghanistan in the fall of 2009. And it's, that's why he, in 2009, announced the withdrawal of troops at the same time that he announced that he was also going to send the surge. So he announced the surge, and in the next sentence, announced the withdrawal of the surge. And the reason for this was to avoid, I think, antagonizing and creating a, a left-wing challenge to him and a primary challenge, a Ted Kennedy to his Jimmy Carter, if you will. However, if you had President Obama on this podcast, he could credibly say, wasn't thinking about politics. I had already lost confidence in Afghanistan as a partner. And I made that calculation solely based on my view that we were going to have to settle for something that was Afghan good enough rather than the ideal. And, and that if I didn't put the end stop in, the, the military would never ever uh, let us settle for something that's only that uh, good. And so this was not, I did not have partisan politics in mind. And I think he could maybe even pass the lie detector test uh, on that. So, so yes, partisan politics matter. There, it's worth studying. I devote a lot of my scholarship to that, uh, but maybe less than the outside um, uh, critics and particularly the, cart the caricature uh, critics would suggest. Peter, we're coming up against the hour, so I, I think we're unfortunately I be uh, more out of time. Concise, yes. No, no, that's that's all right. I mean, well, you you can't, you can't be more uh, concise if the book itself is you know nine hundred pages, right? So a Fair lot a lot to get into, a lot to get into. Well, uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for writing the book. I do think that um, that uh, and the point I think you made repeatedly, which is really important, that this is really a, a resource. This is really meant to be a reference um, over the longer term, and so I do hope that. Uh, students, uh, alumni, people who are thinking about graduate school, people who are um, uh, in uh, think tanks and elsewhere actually do do see it that way and spend more time with it. So, Peter, thank you. Why don't you uh, give us a plug for your for your upcoming book? And I know we'll have you back in a couple months. Well, I also want to apologize to my former student and current research assistant, uh, Dr. Kissinger, whose question we did not get to answer. I owe you one, uh, but I uh, do look forward to coming back and talking to you all in a couple months about my book, Thanks for Your Service, The Causes and Consequences of Public Confidence in the Military, another topic that is uh, debated uh, heavily in partisan politics. That's great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Peter. I'll see everybody soon. My pleasure.